It's the final pitch indeed. A lot to fight for, a lot at stake. And so to discuss that and more in this big, uh, for this big political battle, we're joined by two very fine uh, analysts and experts. Swaminathan Ayer, consulting editor ET Now, and Sadhanan Dume as well, a columnist and a political commentator. Sadhanan, I'm going to start off with you. You know, in any election, I think especially in India, the most important, uh, you know, one word to describe it is hava, you know, what you call momentum. When, when this election started, it seemed as if the Gadbandan had a fair degree of momentum. And then in the next few phases, it seemed as if, uh, you know, the, the, the BJP managed to wrest some of that momentum. Over the last three, four days, You've been, of course, in Varanasi as well. You've seen uh, the political campaigning uh, unfold there as well. What does it look like? Who's got the momentum as we wrap things in this election? So, you know, I've missed most, I've been traveling only in eastern Uttar Pradesh for about the past week, Gorakhpur and Varanasi specifically. And in that part of uh, Uttar Pradesh, you know, with the usual caveats that this is not scientific polling or anything, uh, it was certainly my sense that the BJP seemed to be doing very well. A uh, wide cross-section of persons I spoke with in both these places and between seemed to suggest that they are ahead in the race. Um, but then again, you know, this, this sort of hava and that sort of thing is, you know, it, it's hard to pull together with, with certainty and based on anecdotal observations, but that is my anecdotal observation. Sadhana's anecdotal observation is that the BJP perhaps is, uh, you know, higher in that league as far as Uttar Pradesh is concerned, but the caveat is that he was in Eastern UP and not in West, where they don't seem to have done so well. But Swami, you know, you wrote for the Times of India yesterday, and your view is that uh, the lotus is all set to blossom in Uttar Pradesh. You hold that view despite the fact that uh, the, the kind of momentum we've seen is perhaps true only for Uttar, uh, only for Eastern UP just yet, you were in both Gorakhpur and Varanasi? No, no, the, the moment I'm, I'm seeing is not limited to UP. The momentum I'm seeing starts from all the local elections that we've been seeing ever since you had demonetization on November 8th. So you had the local elections in Maharashtra and BJP did extraordinarily well, won 8 out of the 10 corporations. In uh, Gujarat, in the local elections, Congress, uh, uh, BJP swept those elections, 100 seats. The Congress lost 40 seats. Then again, the BJP swept Chandigarh, Faridabad, and in Odisha, in Odisha until then, the BJP had been a distant third, hardly mattering. But in the local elections now, it zoomed up to second position, completely uh, subduing the Congress and is now posing an actual challenge for the first time to Naveen Patnaik. So what I say is that if you have a wind blowing from Maharashtra and Gujarat through Chandigarh and Faridabad and uh, Orissa, will then Uttar Pradesh be completely immune from this? And I would say no. Uh, so I would, not, uh, I, I would not venture a guess into exactly how many seats. But is the wind blowing for Modi? I would say yes. Would you agree with Swami and the fact that demortization seems to have given the government a fair amount of political gains and probably that could be one of the reasons why they went with this move. But is demortization an issue at all in the conversation that you've had with people across Eastern UP? Do you get a feeling that it's, it's an issue at all and, and are people willing to forgive or uh, forget about the inconvenience that this measure cost uh, because of the potential uh, you know, long-term uh, gains? You know, at the very least, demonetization has not hurt the BJP. I think we can say that categorically. We can say that categorically based on the local election results that Swami spoke about. But also, I spoke with dozens of people about this, including some people who had suffered themselves. But overwhelmingly, they seemed to suggest that it was a decision made in the national interest. It was a start in the war against corruption. Uh, mind you, these are not my views about demonetization. But it was certainly the views of most of the people I've spoken with. And uh, I would agree with uh, Swami that many of us who had believed that this was a, a terrible economic decision for which there would be uh, electoral consequences to pay uh, are just not going to be proved right on that front. 
Swami, you want to come in on that? That demonetization hasn't gone the way most analysts and experts had predicted, including the two uh, experts on our show and, and some of us here in the newsroom and studios as well. But, you know, like, like Sadan and wrote, I think, in uh, the Wall Street Journal, he wrote this uh, earlier this morning, that how economic reforms and, and pro-market reforms are not things that you speak about in elections. They don't win you elections, really. Is that more true of Uttar Pradesh than any other place in India? Uh, it is true of a very large number of rural areas all over India and in Uttar Pradesh, maybe even in some urban areas. The reason is simple. I mean, if you're in a poor backward area, if you're illiterate and have no communications for most of the time, have you, do, have you any idea what an import license is? No. And if therefore import licensing is liberalized, does that mean anything to you? No. Suppose foreign exchange allocations are liberalized, does that mean anything to you? No. On the other hand, if you say instead of a Doordarshan monopoly, can we have a choice of 100 channels? They'll say, yes, we must have that. So when we talk about liberalization, the question is which aspect of it? So there are some aspects of it, yes, which can be discussed. They would certainly prefer multiple choices in a number of different issues, maybe for private banks, for instance. But at the same time, it is not a key issue on either side. Modi has taken this particular thing to a high moral argument. He's saying there is this terrible corruption. There is this culture that anything goes. The Samajwadi party is part of it. The Congress party was part of it. And I am promising you good governance. I am promising you honest governance. I am going to catch these slimy fat cats who have flourished earlier under these two other parties. And I am going to give you a cleaner and newer government. Now this moral dimension to me, appears to be overshadowing the economic issues. As Sadhanan said, uh, so a number of people were adversely hit, and he has argued, I have argued, that in very many ways the whole thing was bungled. Even if, it, even if you wanted to do it, the implementation was terrible. And yet, at the end of it all, it is ultimately seen as a moral issue. And for that, I think Modi is getting electoral rewards. I must finally add that in the rural areas I visited, without exception, they said we are not affected at all by demonetization. We don't have a large number of high currency notes. So some wealthy people might be affected, but not us. Sure. Therefore, the notion propagated by the Congress that the poorest of the poor were hit by note bandi, that is wrong. Certainly some casual laborers were hit. Small enterprises were hit in urban right. areas, right. but not the poorest of the poor. Sure. Swami, just to shift this away from demonetization and note bandi, uh, to talk about the election back again. You know, I know both of you feel that the that the momentum is probably with the BJP. Uh, but the fact remains that, you know, the way the Prime Minister has campaigned over the last four days, you know, he's, he's almost virtually been in Varanasi. I know he's been doing day trips, but he's been in Varanasi. Relentless campaign over four days. The entire cabinet was in, uh, was in his constituency over the weekend. What does that tell you? Is it, isn't it a sign of some somewhat of nervousness or, uh, or is it because they realize that they can't afford to lose uh, uh, you know, seats in, in that uh, constituency? What does that tell you, Swami? Uh, I would say there's something in, <coughs> in both. You know, on the one hand, you see, when the battlefield, the, bat the gunfire is going down place by place, in the last thing, all the big guns can be brought out to focus on one area. So that is one phenomenon that you're seeing. But I think there are some reports in Banaras of dissatisfaction that all the things that Modi promised haven't got very far. For instance, certainly on cleaning the Ganga, there is not the slightest difference right now. I don't think they've even managed to get the land, let alone start anything on that particular project. So there's a bit of both. On the one hand, as I said, all the guns are now available to fire at this particular spot. And also they believe that uh, we need to make a big push out here because Modi must be seen to be winning this particular area. And there are some anxieties as to whether people are fully satisfied. That's why I think you're seeing uh, Banaras becoming such a big show. which is simply that Uttar Pradesh matters so enormously that you can hardly expect any party, a ruling party, to not take it seriously. 
Also, we know that Modi is an all-in kind of guy. That's the way he campaigns. That's the way he's campaigned in many places. So this is a very, very high-stakes election. This is the most important assembly election between 2014 and 2019. It's the Prime Minister's own home state now as an MP. Uh, it should not surprise anyone that he is going all in, and so are other members of his government. If I may, if I may just take on from your point, it, it's almost like Modi is the man to beat in every election now, and more so in Uttar Pradesh for the reasons that you pointed out there. But amidst this very high decibel battle for UP, India's most populous and perhaps the most crucial assembly election, are we missing out the dark horse? Because there are reports that BSP has made significant strides, at least in the last three phases. I mean, of course, I'm discounting the seventh, but at least in the fifth and the sixth phase, uh, BSP hasn't been written off as it was being written off uh, previous to the first day of polling. You know, I'm sympathetic to the idea that the BSP often tends to be uh, underreported. Uh, and that they have this very strong core of support that stands by Mayawati. But I'll take both those caveats on board and then go out on a limb just to make this interesting. Um, I don't think this is their election. It was not my sense in these travels that this is their election. I would be extremely surprised if, uh, a B if the BSP were to form a government. I would be less surprised if somehow SP and Congress were to pull through. So I would say at this point, you know, for Mayawati, we're really looking at an existential crisis. Uh, if she loses, if I'm right and she loses, then we're talking about two back-to-back -back defeats in assembly elections and a national loss in between. Mm -hmm. Swami, do you agree with Sadhanand and do you also feel that either way it's going to be a decisive mandate in line with what we've seen in the recent past? We're unlikely to see a hung parliament. It's going to be an overwhelming vote in favor of the BJP or an overwhelming vote in favor of, uh, of the Gadbandan. Is that how you're likely to see things pan out? Uh, I would say that I will not rule out Mayavati. I do not believe she has any chance of winning an outright majority on her own. But can there be a hung assembly where she holds the balance of power and says, I will uh, take support from whoever is willing to make me chief minister? I mean, this surely is her game. Uh, her game at this point, I don't think, is to try and win an outright majority. That would be beyond her in the current circumstances. But there have been many examples in the past when uh, as part of a coalition, she, has, she was chief, chief minister three times. So that is the kind of scenario I think she has in mind. And if she gets, I mean, she has strong core support. So I would say surely she will get, say, 60 seats, uh, at least, something like that. If that 60 seats is critical for forming a government, and I'm not saying it will be, it may not be, but if it is critical, then she is strongly positioned to bargain. How much people will give her, I don't know. It will depend on the actual numbers. Let's see. But she, will, she is a person who has managed to become chief minister uh, with, uh, without being anywhere near a large majority on her own. And I will not rule out the possibility of that happening again. And Mayawati is known to be a tough bargainer there. She's, uh, she's an uncanny politician who slept both with Mulayam and with the BJP at one point in time. But Sadaran, you know, this election, uh, like Bihar, I mean, Bihar, I remember Mr. Jaitley telling us here on ET now that they, uh, they underestimated the index of opposition unity. Is UP going to test the index of opposition unity, the Samajwadi Party and the Congress together? For one, it's a question of political survival. For another, a question of political relevance. What does, what does this election really mean for the Congress Party as well and for the whole index of opposition unity this whole gut bandhan politics against the bjp i think that's a great question um, my sense is that if the congress and sp manage to pull this off which is a possibility then the congress has been given a lifeline it's in the game going ahead into 2019 at least as a sort of anchor as a glue that can bring together non bjp forces if the congress loses and should that be coupled with a loss in punjab uh, it really looks bad because if you kind of, you know, go back and, and look at the decline of Rahul Gandhi, I'd say it all starts in UP. It starts in UP 2012 where he sort of, you know, talks big about reviving the Congress, ends up doing miserably. And then since then, things have, you know, more or less been downhill for him, except for sort of, you know, a few things here and there, such as Karnataka. So if UP goes badly, despite the Congress agreeing to be the junior partner, despite Rahul Gandhi giving up pre any pretense of reviving the Congress, uh, I think that things would look really bad for his leadership and for the party.
Uh, uh, Swami, just to play the devil's advocate, you know, uh, is, it, is it a battle about, is it Akhilesh versus Modi or Akhilesh versus who? Because, you know, uh, over the last two years, the states where the BJP has done well are states where they've sort of declared a chief ministerial candidate. For obvious reasons, they've not been able to do that in the, in the case of Uttar Pradesh. So, is it going to be, is that going to work to the advantage of the, of the Gadbandan that they don't have a clear uh, sort of leader, uh, a potential chief ministerial candidate that the, the BJP doesn't? And Akhilesh, no matter people might be, might have resentment against the old guard, resentment against SP, Congress, but Akhilesh seems to have emerged as a mass leader with, with a fair degree of popularity. Okay, uh, a long complicated issue. First, take the case of Bihar. In Bihar, the important thing was not that the Congress joined the other two. The important thing in Congress was that Nitish Kumar and Lalu Yadav got together. That would have won regardless of whether Congress was independent or joining them. The Congress was irrelevant to that victory. The two big guns opposing the BJP, they got together. The analogy in Uttar Pradesh would have been, suppose Mayavati and Akhilesh had got together to form a non-BJP front, maybe along with the Congress, would that have mattered? That would have been an interesting proposition, but of course it did not happen. And in a large number of states, it will not easily happen. It will happen only if the BJP wins so overwhelmingly again and again that people are willing to put aside other animosities just to tackle the BJP. And in Uttar Pradesh, that is not the case right now. Uh, you, then, okay, now let's come to Akhilesh. Akhilesh has an advantage. Uttar Pradesh is a badly governed state overall, uh, relative to other states. When this is the case, anti-incumbency is typically very, very strong. Therefore, in a state like UP, typically, uh, the incumbent will lose and an anti-incumbent will be voted in. In this particular case, we had a situation where Akhilesh quarreled with his father, broke with his father, subdued his father and emerged victorious. To that extent, Akhilesh is in some sense the incumbent, but also the anti-incumbent who can give people the hope that things will be different this time if we give Akhilesh another term. So I think this, give, this is what gives Akhilesh the advantage, not the alliance with Congress, which matters very little. But the fact that Akhilesh has some anti-incumbent credentials, I think definitely gives him an advantage. Will it be enough? No, I don't think it will be enough. So, Dhanan, you want to come in on that? It's, it's quite an interesting election because Akhilesh seems to be this anti-establishment man. I mean, hello, let's remind our viewers and let's remind voters out there. Akhilesh was the chief minister since 2012. It wasn't Shivpal, it wasn't Mulayam. He was the chief minister. He occupied that chair. But suddenly it seems in these elections that he wants to get rid of that baggage and he becomes this anti-establishment guy and it looks like voters on the ground are actually warming up to that concept. Yeah, I mean, he appears to have a clean image. He appears to be sincere. Uh, that goes for him. But, you know, I would take the point about his alliance with Congress even one, one step further than Swami. Uh, not only do I think that Congress is not bringing much to the party, in some ways it may even be hurting the SP. Uh, it's given away 100 seats, which is a lot. It's about a quarter of the seats. And, it, and you find people speaking about Akhilesh Yadav and saying that, you know, he's okay, but I think less of him for having made that alliance. I think it, it's, uh, many people think it signifies weakness and also signifies poor judgment. So it'll be interesting to see uh, to what degree Congress ends up being uh, more of a millstone uh, than a boy for, for the uh, Samajwadi party. Closing comments, Sadan, and you go first. Uh, the downside, uh, you know, from a market point of view, it's quite obvious that the markets have sort of started to price in a BJP victory. What if that were not to come through? How big a setback is that going to be for, uh, for markets in general? You know, I think if the, you know, we, we, both of us over here have been saying that we think the BJP is going to do well, but let's just say hypothetically that the BJP underperforms badly, uh, does poorly. Uh, it's a huge setback for the Prime Minister because what it ends up doing is resurrecting the narrative of 2015. Right? In the last few years, we have two dominant narratives. The narrative of 2014, which is the BJP is the new force in town and that's the party to beat. And the narrative of 2015, which is, you know what, Modi is beatable. If they lose in Uttar Pradesh, the narrative of 2015 will be dominant rather than the narrative of 2014.
you agree that uh, this election is, is really about whether Modi and Shah are invincible or not? And in that sense, markets and stakeholders and investors who believe in this government, who believe in what they're doing, will perhaps, they take, will perhaps take their cues from here? Uh, certainly, he's not an invincible. He got thrashed, utterly thrashed last year in Delhi and uh, Bihar. Thrashed so badly that, you know, it didn't have any force face to show. So they're certainly not invincible. They are certainly vulnerable depending on what happens in local conditions in different places. Uh, you ask what will happen if, to the markets if he doesn't get a majority. It will depend on what exactly that means. Suppose he gets 180, 100, uh, suppose he gets 180 to 85 to 190 seats. I think while he has not got a majority, with the help of independents and uh, Ajit Singh and so on, they would probably still be able to form a government. Suppose they get only 150 and the SP forms a government entirely on its own. That would be a significantly different kind of setback. That would certainly raise questions as to whether the Modi magic is still working. Till now, because we have seen uh, the number of state, uh, uh, the number of local elections in the states where the Modi magic seems to have worked, there is a feeling that perhaps it will apply to the UP too. If it doesn't, if they get a real drubbing and they only win 150 seats, then I think you know all kinds of new calculations would be made. At the end of those new calculations, I think the conclusion still will be that Modi is probably here for a full 10 years. Because suppose he loses 50 seats in the next uh, Lok Sabha elections. From 335, they'll be down to 285. They're still back. Suppose they lose 70 seats. He's still down to 265, handshaking distance of a majority. So, you know, they would have to lose more than 100 seats in parliament to become vulnerable. And even then, they might be able to cobble together a coalition. So, as I said, in, if Modi loses UP, it definitely hurts. But it does not mean he will not win in, 200 and, in 2019. Right. Uh, if Modi loses UP, it will hurt, it will make for great headlines, it will revive the opposition, but it doesn't necessarily mean that he'll lose 2019. Mm -hmm. A lot at play. Markets are going to be keeping a keen eye on things as they unfold uh, over the next uh, few days. March 11, that's the big day when we will know which way the voter in Uttar Pradesh has, uh, has uh, made a move. Uh, Sazanan Dume, Swaminathan Nair, thank you so much for taking time out and joining in and analyzing all that's at stake uh, in these mega elections. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash etnow and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at etnowlive. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com slash user slash etnow.